Well, hey there, welcome to a new year at Heimler's History. Now, in case you hadn't heard, the new AP World History curriculum begins in the year 1200 CE, or AD, depending on your persuasion. And that means that they have cut millennia out of the curriculum. Now, it's not my intention to comment on whether or not that's a good change or a bad change. I'm just here to give you some context so that when we plop down into 1200, we know what's going on. So, sort of the meta question that we're going to be dealing with in this video is how did the human race survive and thrive all the way up to 1200? And I'm going to start about 10,000 years ago in this massive, unfolding event called the Neolithic Revolution, or sometimes called the Agricultural Revolution. Now, prior to the Neolithic Revolution, human beings just basically survived by hunting and gathering and wandering from place to place. But somebody, and nobody really knows who, discovered that if you plant seeds in the ground on purpose, and then you wait around for those seeds to sprout up into crops, then you will have a lot more food than you would by hunting and gathering. Now, the phenomenon of farming took place all around the world at roughly the same time, give or take a few centuries, but the OG farmers came from Southwest Asia, or to put a finer point on it, Mesopotamia. And it is hard to oversell the consequences of the advent of farming. First, instead of wandering from location to location, now people largely settled in one place. And as a result of that, they began to build permanent structures, especially for the storage of crops and the purposes of religion. Not only that, but when you've got more than enough food, people start making babies ad nauseum, and there was a huge population explosion. Now, as I mentioned before, this happened all over the world at different times and in different circumstances. But one thing that was common to all these agricultural societies is that they grew up around water, specifically rivers. And among the most important river valley societies were the following. The Nile River Society in North Africa, the Yellow River Valley in East Asia, the Indus River Valley in South Asia, the river valleys of Mesoamerica, and the Andes Mountain Society. So apparently when people stay in one place for their crops for long enough, they will eventually create cities. In fact, the word civilization just means a society that has a city. The first of the major cities came onto the stage about 6,000 years ago, first in Mesopotamia and then in the Nile River Valley. And the building program in these cities was astonishing. They built pyramids and ziggurats and palaces for the elite, and one of the consequences of this elaborate ordering of society was hierarchy. And hierarchy just means that these societies were broken up into groups of people that were distinguished by class. And those at the top of the hierarchy were usually the ones who were writing the laws and levying taxes on all the plebes down below. Now, one of the most famous legal codes was called the Code of Hammurabi, and this code laid down clear lines for societal hierarchies and punishments for lawbreaking. Now, when we hear an eye for an eye, we tend to think of the first five books of the Jewish scriptures, namely the books of Moses. But the justice system of Hammurabi was the first to mention an eye for an eye. And maybe of equal importance during this time was the invention of writing. Now the first uses of this technology were to keep track of the grain supplies in any given city. In Mesopotamia, the written language was called cuneiform, and in Egypt it was called hieroglyphics. But eventually, written language burst free from these utilitarian purposes, and they began to produce literature. And in this literature, they wrote stories that explained the creation of the world and expounded the meaning of life. The most famous of these was the Epic of Gilgamesh from Mesopotamia, the Book of the Dead from Egypt, and the Rig Veda from the Indus Valley. Also during this time, some of the world's major religions emerged out of these civilizations. Out of the Indus River Valley, Hinduism arose. Now, Hinduism was a polytheistic religion, which is to say they worshipped many gods. And it taught that one overall god spirit revealed itself in many forms. And then all the way over in Southwest Asia, two of the great monotheistic religions, which is to say they worshipped one god, arose. The Persians gave us Zoroastrianism, and the Hebrews over in Israel gave us Judaism. Now, eventually, cities that were in close proximity to each other, especially those who held similar religious beliefs, united to form the early empires. And you should know that the kings of these empires almost always claimed divinity in order to consolidate their power. And one more thing about this period. Not every human being on the planet during this time was accounted for in terms of a city or an empire. There was still a significant group of people who continued their hunting and gathering in nomadic ways, and they are known as the pastoralists. And we'll see how important they were later, but for now you just need to understand that by going to and fro between the major civilizations, Pastoralists fostered important connections and cultural exchanges between those empires. Okay, that gets us up to about 600 BCE, in which there is a new turning point for the thriving and the surviving of human beings. At this point in history, the world is getting way more populated and therefore way more complicated, so I'm going to break this down into two sections. First, we'll look at religious and cultural developments, and then second, we'll look at the developments of city-states and empires. All right, first, religious and cultural developments. During this period, the major religions develop and spread into new territories. Jews, for example, bring their religion into all corners of the known world, and usually this happened not because they chose to, but because they were compelled to by foreign invaders. Around 600 BCE, the Assyrians invaded Israel and brought many Jews back to Assyria as prisoners of war, and later the Romans scattered the Jews all over their empire as well. But sometimes Judaism did spread because it was carried voluntarily by Jewish merchants to all the major trade cities across Europe and South Asia and East Asia. All right, go over to India at this time, and Hinduism becomes the fundamental ordering principle for Indian society, especially its teaching on caste. This teaching 
said that all living things were ordered into a hierarchical structure. And a living being could move up or down that structure, not in this life, but in a series of successive lives depending on their behavior. So it's important to know that Hinduism became the social glue that held Indian society together for millennia. But these two religions themselves also experienced change during this time. Out of Hinduism came a new system of belief called Buddhism, which began in South Asia around 500 BCE. Buddhism still held, for example, the teaching about reincarnation that came from Hinduism, but it differed in the way that it did away with the hierarchical caste system. So the main teaching of Buddhism is that life is suffering, and that the reason why we suffer is because we desire, and therefore the way to stop suffering is to kill desire. How do you do that? Well, you live a life that follows a set of behaviors outlined in something called the Eightfold Path. And then, out of Judaism arose Christianity. In the first century, a prophet and a preacher from northern Israel by the name of Jesus of Nazareth came onto the scene, and he preached that salvation is not by means of proper behavior, but by believing in his own saving death and resurrection for the forgiveness of sins. And even these two innovations were innovated upon as they spread into different cultures. As Buddhism traveled into different cultures in the East, it developed new forms. You get forms like Theravada Buddhism and Mahayana Buddhism, which were more salvationist religions than the original teachings of the Buddha. And as Christianity spread, there were at least two major distinctive expressions of it. You had the Roman Catholics on the West, and then you had the Orthodox Christians, known as the Byzantines in the East. All right, let's fly over to China and see what's happening there. During this period, the teachings of Confucius came to unify China after a period of turmoil known as the Warring States period. Now, Confucianism became the bedrock of Chinese society because it provided a predictable way of ordering society based on a hierarchical structure. According to Confucius, if everybody in a society plays their particular role and plays it rightly, then that society will be at peace. Rulers must rule wisely, subjects must subject themselves with deference, and on and on and on. Now, many empires are going to come and go throughout Chinese history, but Confucianism is the one thing that seems to be a continuity throughout all of them. Now, about the same time that Confucianism is making its debut in China, Taoism is coming onto the scene in East Asia. Now, Confucius emphasized the ordering of human relations, but Taoists taught that people must look away from human creations and institutions and look to the order of nature for how to live. Then if we fly over to Africa and the Americas and some parts of East Asia, we'll see a religious form called animism and shamanism. Animism taught that the natural world had spiritual power embedded in it, and shamans were the priestly kind of folks that had access to control and direct that spiritual power. And these religious forms had endless variations depending on where you found them. Okay, that's how religions were developing during this period. Now let's turn our attention to the development of city-states and empires. So the major city-states and empires, for the most part throughout the world, knew about each other. If they were divided by large distances, sometimes they became trading partners. And then just as often, if they were close to one another, they went to war. And one of the consequences of frequent war between different empires was the exchange of technology. <laughs> oh man, this thing you just stabbed me with is way better than that thing I just tried to stab you with. Hey guys, we gotta get one of these. All right, so let's just fly around the world again into six different regions and see what's going on with their empires and city-states. Let's start with the Persian empires. The first notable mention is the Achaemenid Empire, which lasted from about 550 to 330 BCE. And this empire was so large that the empire Emperor used regional leaders called satraps to govern the affairs of different districts. And they produced an elaborate highway system that served to move armies quickly to distant parts of the empire. As is the case with many of these old empires, the Achaemenids overextended themselves and therefore became vulnerable to attack. And it was the Greek hero Alexander the Great who did the honor of conquering them. But about a century later, the Parthian Empire arose and took back much of what had been taken by Alexander. Now the Chinese empires. Here we need to consider the Qin and the Han dynasties. So after a tumultuous and chaotic period known as the Warring States period, the Qin Dynasty came into being in 220 BCE. Now the Chinese believed in something called the Mandate of Heaven, which said that the heavens would provide for them a leader who would rule them with justice. That is, until that ruler started governing like a turd, and then he would be ousted. So after the Warring States period, the heavens provided Qin Shi Huangdi, and he established the philosophy of legalism, which gave to the Chinese society clear rules of command and strict layers of bureaucracy. And everything was good in that legalistic society, as long as you followed the rules, but if not, the punishments were severe. Now the Qin Dynasty itself didn't last very long at all. It ended in 206 BCE, but it did establish a dynastic foundation that would be in place in China for centuries and millennia to come. After the Qin came the Han Dynasty, which lasted for another 400 years. And the Han Dynasty existed roughly at the same time period as the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire. And as such, the Hans and the Romans established diplomatic ties with one another and patterns of trade. Now, the Han Empire was at least as big as the Roman Empire and at least as wealthy, but pound for pound, it was technologically far more advanced than the Romans were. It was the Hans who began building the Great Wall of China in order to squash invasions from the north, and that construction continued for the next thousand years. 
Han rulers also dug canals that linked the north to the south, which not only provided conditions for a flourishing trade, but also helped the government keep the empire unified with a common culture. All right, let's look at the Mediterranean empires. First, let's stop by the Phoenician city-states. Now, because of their advanced seafaring capabilities, the Phoenicians established colonies all throughout Greece and Italy and North Africa and Spain. And usually these colonies were established not by military conquest, but by diplomacy and trade. And it was the Phoenicians that gave us the oldest known alphabet and taught its people to read from left to right. If you can read this, thank a Phoenician. Now the Phoenicians deeply influenced the next group of people we're going to consider in the Mediterranean, namely the Greeks. The system of Greek city-states came onto the scene about 600 BCE and exited around 330 BCE. The Greeks gave to the world the ideas of citizenship and democracy. And just so you know, the democratic process in the Greek city-states only included free white males. But don't let that sully the idea that people actually had the ability to influence their government. At the time, this was a revolutionary idea. And then a little later come the Romans. The Romans were deeply influenced by Greek culture, even though the Roman army conquered Greece about a century after Alexander the Great's death. And the Romans were deeply dedicated to building, and you see this in their great aqueducts and their extensive system of roads. And just like the Han, the Romans encouraged the spread and settlement of its people throughout the vast stretches of its empire in order to solidify the Roman culture. The western half of the empire, centered in Rome, fell in 476. But the eastern half of the empire, centered in Constantinople, lasted for another thousand years. And last of all, let's fly over to the Americas and see what's happening in the Mesoamerican and Andean civilizations. First, in Mesoamerica, you've got the Mayans, and in their civilization, they built huge monumental structures that functioned as religious temples. And they were famous for advancing the process of agriculture and systems of writing and astronomical charting. And let's not forget, they got real good at human sacrifice. Also, another honorable mention in this area goes to a city called Teotihuacan. You've probably never even heard of it, but it was one of the largest cities in the world at that time, claiming over 200,000 inhabitants. They had a complex governmental bureaucracy, huge reservoirs, and whole apartment complexes made out of stone. And last of all, let's visit our friends in South America. The Moca civilization in the Andean region lasted from about 100 to 800 CE. Its government was controlled by a class of warrior priests, and they bore many similarities to other Mesoamerican civilizations. Okay, our trip around the world while incomplete is complete. And that was a lot to take in, but let me try to summarize everything I've said by way of comparison. Before 1200, cities were important parts of every empire, and all the ancient cities contained hubs of art, trade, religious structures, and governmental buildings. The social structures of ancient civilizations were pretty similar too. For the most part, societies were organized hierarchically. At the top, you had the political religious elites, and under them, and the order depends on which civilization you're looking at, you had merchants and warriors and craftspeople and laborers and slaves. And all the old empires fell for some combination of the following three reasons. Overextension, internal disruptions, and outside invaders. Now you may have noticed that after all of this we have not yet reached up to 1200. But once we start the AP World History curriculum proper, we're going to be reaching back into these events in order to give you the context for everything that happened in 1200. Hey, good luck this year in AP World History. If you want more videos like this one for the new AP World History curriculum, then subscribe and come along. I'll be releasing new content videos every single week of this school year. So, Heimler out.